Erin. It's lovely to be here. It's so strange still to be online. Um, so I, I've been, I'm going to read tonight. I, I was thinking a lot about this healing and there I teach narrative medicine and I, I teach uh, at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine. I teach the uh, medical students uh, yoga and uh, the philosophy of yoga, the sort of life of yoga and philosophy. Uh, my background is in religious studies from the University of Chicago uh, Divinity School, and I teach yoga to children. So there's a lot of voices of children. My daughter's here, which is great that she's up for this. It's early. And I'll be reading later about um, three poems about her and, and one sort of by her in a sense, because it's a monologue where it's her voice. But um, I, I've been also just given that it's been a hard year um, and you know, I've been thinking a lot about the healing we all need as a nation and as individuals, just with COVID and with Trump and the toxicity. But then, you know, for me, it was very disturbing, um, even the, the Camp Auschwitz t-shirts and all that. And I, but I didn't want to be too harsh, but I, I did in 2017, um, our house was vandalized in South Philly. And I had, I came home from teaching at Temple to find a J on my, on my, on my house. And my neighbor found this, um, Nazi skinhead who was in the process of writing the whole word on my house. And, um, and then that, I think a week later, Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times asked for poets to write about Trump. Maybe we could write about Trump. So I sent him, a, I wrote a poem about the J and my daughter was just five then and she was just learning her alphabet. So I, I will share the screen because I think it's much easier to see um, you know, the poetry, if we can share. So let me see if I can do that and share so you can read along, <laughs> sing along. Um, so this is called the story of the letter J. Can you see? Okay, this is called, and so part of this was in the New York Times. And um, here's the whole poem. A J spray painted on my olive green house in South Philly. Its white hooked tail grazes my daughter's head. A skinhead, says my neighbor, Jorge, un racist blanco, no entiendo, holding my hand inside his hand far longer than any gringo would. He smells of sawdust and cologne. I shoot a picture with my phone of my daughter underneath the J. Evidence is always good to gather. She traces the letter with her small finger. She's just learning about how letters make words and words make sentences. Doesn't yet know sentences can kill. Arbeit macht frei. Sentences can lie, make America great again. Sentences can heal. I have a dream. She's fished a pen from my bag and draws a K beside the J. A new story begins across the street Mozart seeps out of the second story, 12-year-old Anita from China. Jorge and I look up as if music were something to be seen, as though it were something we could hold on to. I'll paint for you, he says solemnly. It will be like new, like it never happened. So there was a little poetic license in that. Um, and I, I've, I've been writing a long time about um, war, and uh, this is um, in my hometown in East Rockaway in Long Island. Um, there was this man in this wheelchair. So, of course, a lot of things come from the personal. The personal is political, and uh, there, there, this was a vet, and, um, and I've been thinking a lot because we are in perpetual war. So this is called Local One. The vets sit in wheelchairs watching the crane tear down the East Point in Fish House. The sun sets fire to the aluminum foil between one vet's legs. I imagined the fire last time he set one foot in front of the other in Vietnam another country ago. He's eating a bologna sandwich and feeds the ends of the Wonder Bread to the birds that gather round the wheels of the chair the way his grandkids, who come every other Christmas, gather round their sweaty palms open to receive, what? The body of Christ, a crisp $5 bill. Lines of old songs come from time to time, the way certain clouds settle between shoulder blades, turning your body into a cheap motel. Such stubborn clouds can make you feel like you're a squeaky spring in your gut, 
that the walls are thin and someone might overhear this faulty murmur. Next thing you know, your daughter will send you to the doctors. He musses up their hair, presses an electric button that lets him roll off the mountain top of memory. It gets too crowded sometimes to, to just sit still. The crane's rocking now back and forth, aimed to hit its target, the old fish house where he had his first fish fry, where he proposed to his wife, where they fastened the baby into her high chair and fed her peas and carrots. I pass the pond and watch the vets feed the birds. Miniature American flags stick out of their wheelchairs. Even the most dangerous memories insist on remaining local, are stubborn as hiccups that will not leave the body settle like dust or innocence between the ears. I think their bodies are my flags, stuck inside me, resistant even to the demolition that happens next door around the picket fence, where the light glows, the birds gather daily. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. And, um, I, I lost my parents when I was very young. Um, I was 26 when my mother died of pancreatic cancer, and I was 31 when my dad died. And um, I am writing a memoir now, and um, you know, I realize I, I really do live with ghosts, and I talk to the dead as much as I talk to the living. And uh, so this one is, is called Secrets, but it's a happier poem, I think. One, when my father was moving from being to being nothing, I was about to go for a bike ride. His right hand rose up from under the blue blanket as he patted the bed for me to sit. I sat and stroked his face, so thin and unshaven it appeared slender as the flat iron building. Two, in summer we could sit in the yard for hours eating cherries, throwing the pits the dog would chase. We're planting cherry trees, he'd say. In winter, we raced through bowls of green pistachios, seeing who could track them faster. We'd set aside the sealed ones, the ones that stubbornly refused to be opened, the ones with no crack. Daddy said they have secrets they can't bear to share with us yet. He poured the uncracked nuts into a ceramic bowl. He never disturbed the bowl, but sometimes he would lift it as though it were a seashell. He would nod his head. He was a quiet man. Three, you will listen to your father's slow breath, place ice chips on his cracked lips. You will listen to the final rattle and remember a baby's noisemaker, daddy's keys. Four, any stillness I possess belongs in a yard where another family lives in the midst of cherry trees they cannot see. <laughs> oh, for Klempt. And this is going back to my hometown. Um, there was a, uh, a man um, who we called Mr. Touch, and he was also a Vietnam vet. And the rumor was is that he had to touch everything to make sure it wasn't a bomb. And um, so this is called Like Mr. Touch. He looks like Mr. Touch, he who walked around my hometown, laying hands on things, fire hydrants, grocery carts, trees, cars. Once he touched me, came up behind me, pressed his hands lightly upon my back. I turned to see his bearded face, blue eyes, his mouth full of cement, a hole of memory. He walked away, a ghost. He touched things to make sure they weren't bombs. In Hebrew, the word for bomb is the same as the word for pomegranate, rimon, a burst of red. He had been to Vietnam. No one knows he touched me, bidding me to explode into a thousand seeds so he could rest. And, you know, my daughter being born uh, later in my life, it was just an event for my husband and I. And um, we, we bubbleize her, as my husband says. It's a verb. <laughs> and, um, and this is, I've always loved cherry blossoms. They're sort of ephemeral beauty. And, and this is uh, very much for Rachel, my little one here. Momentary. Cherry blossoms arrive, enter and exit on the narrow street. 
sometimes a single branch, sometimes the tree itself. The cuckoo today keened an elegiac tone. It flew away, but its echo remains. In the last ultrasound, you held the umbilicus the way Lady Liberty holds her torch, the way a warrior holds a sword. Will you be a tightrope walker, my girl, with cherry blossom eyes? Tell me you know how to contort time. Tell me the season will be different. And here's another one for Rachel. It's called Voice. What will your voice sound like once it comes out of your body, like a first rain, first snow, first wind, hail, sun, bird? I've become an idolater, Lord, almost a murderer as I squeeze her in my midnight arms. How will I protect her, wrap her, tease her into this thing called language, the cut of life? How will I unwound her from the noise of redemption, so busy revealing itself outside the window at the bus stop in front of a pyramid of seedless grapes? She's going to say, Mom, don't cry. She's waiting for me to cry. I am. <laughs> she is. <laughs> and this is my daughter later, after her voice came out, my daughter connects the dots on my age spots, turns my hand into a board game, asks me if the tooth fairy exists, tells me she likes the apple cider donuts I accidentally made with apple cider vinegar, tells me she wants to be a teacher like me and asks me whether you can drink blood because her tooth is loose, asks me why I named her after my mother who is dead, whether it's okay if she names her daughter after me. Even if you're alive, your hand looks like a spider's web. Can I color it in now with non-toxic marker? I promise to stay in the lines. She sniffs my gray hairs and pets the wiry strands down, tells me to let it all go gray. I've been thinking that Jews probably can't have fireplaces or chimneys. That way Santa knows which houses to visit and which not to visit. She's coloring the base of my thumb, the one I almost cut off when I was bartending in Brooklyn. She kisses the scar, asks me if I want a rainbow design or something abstract. I wonder what Rothko was thinking when he painted that pointing to a frame poster over the TV that looks like a praying sunset, her face a mess of concentrated innocence, her hands a sculptor of time and questions. Any questions? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is another one, and uh, this is really all in Rachel's voice, and uh, my daughter explains books and death to me. Maybe next time you'll read it, we'll rehearse. No. No? Okay. When a story you tell becomes a book, the book becomes like a little baby coffin for the words that are like half alive and half not alive. So not exactly dead. Like the book is this third thing between life and death. Like, let me see if I can explain it this way. The words were dying, which means forgotten for a variety of reasons, like not enough people saying them because they couldn't remember them. Like Natalia in first grade can't remember her sister Jenna's phone number or the capitals of European cities because she says, why do I need to remember if I can Google it? So anyway, the words are dying, like with the death rattle thing and everything. I mean, if you got really quiet, you could hear the whole planet rattle like a snake. So the words had to be gathered inside the pages of this thing called a book. But something was also lost since the words and letters, especially the letter Q and Z and W and V were dying. And the only thing that made them happy and infused them with life was when people read them to themselves or aloud. It didn't matter. Like the scientists measured this. So this could revive the words and keep them half alive. You just open a book and let your eyes read the words. And this makes the letters in the book really happy. They begin to cry. And you can feel the tears inside your own body too. It all starts over here in your heart, beside your lungs, near your ribs. And when you read, 
your breathing becomes more steady and your mouth becomes more still and the letters float around and tangle with your cells and that's how memories begin to take shape. It's kind of half mysterious, but really scientific at the same time. So reading is like visiting an open grave, but it's not a sad place. It's a place of possibility because the body can stand up and rise and dance any minute because when you read anything can happen and it does. The dead dance of Viennese waltz on a rainy night and Oma slurps chicken soup, cherry blossoms, cha-cha, dragons eat tacos and crayons talk. And you are a superpower hero goddess because by reading, you're saving the book from the same fate as the dinosaurs. <laughs> I have a question. What's your question? Why did you write that? <laughs> bravo, Lisa. What, Aaron? He just said, I said bravo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I have just three more. Is that okay, Aaron? Two more. Are we okay? On time? Yes? Okay. I don't hear. Yes, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. So this is uh this is a poem definitely uh, about the body and politics and song and it's called after the rain after the rain the puddles in the lawn chair reflect trees lost leaves like a man with a receding hairline after the rain the ache of fall settles in the air like spider webs atop the bushes worms invade my dried turkish apricots and the chicken is undersalted after the rain I crave oatmeal, walnut cookies, and a glass of milk. I crave sex hard and raw to stop time. Yes, hard sex that stops time. Something to chew on like taffy, raw beef, seaweed, mineral, rich. After the rain, I run five miles, leaping over puddles, Kierkegaard style. I listen to Coltrane and Neil Young, Elvis Costello and Janis Joplin. I break open the red when sufficient time has passed between the fall of the sun and the rise of the moon. After the rain, I want the carnival to come to town to set up a tent between the church and the abortion clinic. And I want all the kids with ADD to throw away their drugs and all the tired mothers to get drunk. And I want to sway my hips until the birds start singing their song. And I want to know a man who understands the Saturnian rings I make, the circular twists and turns of my body's often sloppy penmanship. I want him to know how I dot my I's and cross my T's. I want him to dot my I's and cross my T's. Oh, Lord, after the rain, I'm so wet. I don't know what to do with the only body I've been given and given and given. Kind of felt weird reading that in front of my daughter. She left. She left. I realized she's tired. she's tired. She doesn't get it. It's like, it's okay. Um, and this is the last, um, this is the last poem. And it was uh, most definitely inspired by um, the events on January 5th, this insurrection 6th. And um, this Camp Auschwitz t-shirts, um, two of my, well, I had one grandfather who died in a camp and all my family on both my adopted side and my biological side are Holocaust survivors. My two fathers and um, my mother and, um, and, all, and my grandmother. So I have a lot of, um, I am writing a book now about this double Holocaust inheritance and um, lots of doubling, but uh, it, it feels, um, it feels I didn't expect to be triggered by these, um, you know, six million is not enough, but I am a, a second generation child of survivors and I can't, I'm, I'm surprised myself. So I, I in the poem, um, there's a reference to Salon and I don't know if, how many of you are, are familiar with this uh, black milk of daybreak, this poem. Um, so it just goes like this, the verse, he was a German survivor of the Holocaust. His mother died both his parents, I believe. And it says, um, he says in German, black milk of daybreak, we drink it at evening, we drink it at midday, and morning we drink it at night, we drink and we drink. We shovel a grave in the air, there you won't lie too cramped. Again, never. The days compose themselves against a winter sky, red scarf, white balloon, 
a helicopter on a hospital roof by an American river, a Jewish child's hand reaches out from an unfinished grave. Her mouth is full of earth. The sky is blue witness, but it's not mine. God is carving a swastika into the outside wall of my house. It makes God thirsty. He drinks Salon's black milk. I drink Salon. And that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. wow. Beautiful, Lisa. All Thank good. You. Thank you. Really important work. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lisa. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leela. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Thank Unbelievable. you. Unbelievable. Yeah. Great. Just Thank great. You. Excellent. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you for bringing all that work okay. and yeah. all that effort. And thank you for sharing your family there with us. Mm. Yes, yes. All the generations. All the generations. Yeah, yes. Bringing all that to life. Thank you. You're any, welcome. Any questions that you have for Lisa, uh, could you put them in the um, chat? And then maybe, are you going to be able to hang around for just a minute? Or do Oh, you yeah, to yeah. And my books, if you want a book, just let me know. I can, they're, they're on Amazon, but I can send you one and anything. Sure. Yeah. Great. Great. I have used poetry in my teaching as a healing device. Most, the, the longest place I ever worked uh, was the county jail and uh, on the maximum security floor with men where I taught these guys how to write villanelles and sestinas and sonnets and it was crazy uh, because it's, it, it, just, it, it just seemed wild and they had so much time that they loved these puzzles. That's what the formal poetry was. It was puzzles. And they just followed the rules. This is why I teach formal poetry. I think the poems are all in us, but we have things that block them, our, our own judgments, our own fears. And so when we write formal poetry and we're following the rules, we can actually get out of the way so the poem can come out. So that's, uh, I've done it in lots of communities and uh, we laugh a lot, I can say that. Uh, I also write a poem every day, at least one. And today is day 3309, and I'd like to read them to you now. I'm just kidding, I know you can't even respond to that. Uh, <clears throat> I lost my mom five weeks ago, and so tonight I'm reading poems about mother and the mothers in my life. Uh, I was raised by a black woman who mothered me and uh, that's who the book Both Wings Flappin' is about. And uh, so I wanna start off with a poem about her in her voice. What Mary said. Baby, I'd be telling you a lie if I didn't tell you I had some regrets. But I have seen you don't understand yet. I really trust the Lord. I put prayers and faith first. You got to believe in what you ask for. You might not get it right now, but you has to have faith. I can get stirred up so bad until I get my Bible and I read the 37th Psalm all the way through. I reads it. You just read it again. You'll understand what it's telling you to do. We're all going to have those kinds of days. We can't make it and have no trials or tribulations at all. I get up in the morning. I can't stoop down. I can't do this and I can't do the other. And I sits there on that bed and I boohoos. I cries. Water just runs down. And then I says, well, Lord, I'm just grateful I can do what I am doing. Because it's really hard when you used to could do something and now you can't do and you want to. You've got to thank the Lord for what you have. He didn't promise you every day it's going to be sunshine because some days it's going to rain.
Thank you, thank you. I, that's right, to look up. Uh, this next poem is a terzarima. And I love the terzarima because it's a, it's a form of poem that can be expanded to be as long as you want or shrunk down. It's the accordion style, I like that. So this one is called Skating on Thin Ice. Uh, the the, the terzarima is a poem that has rhymes. I'll just give you little little information about them. Okay, skating on thin ice. Listen, I am skating on thin ice, balancing on the razor's edge, these skates I wear some rare torture device. Tighten up the skates is what you said. Then I could skate flawlessly like you, even backwards. I moved on the ice with feet of lead, terrified of falling. My repeated view was the sky on my back, smack. Up above the sky was icy blue, while my self-esteem was under attack. I can't sing, I can't dance, we're nothing alike, as bam, I hit the ice on my back. Eventually the trees clear in my sight, and curling from the side the smell of smoke rising from the large communal fire. I get hot, so I dispatch my coat, then return for round two of my war with the ice. I wonder who is keeping score since my progress is pathetic so far. Gripping the wall, I drag myself along pretending I'm having fun, but this is hard work and now the day is feeling too long. I wish my knees were padded as well as my butt. I'm not that strong and it's something when you asked I should have added, but all I really wanted was your attention, which I usually receive while acting badly which was never my true intention. I wanted you, but was too afraid to mention. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. These are difficult to read, I'm finding. <sighs> hibiscus. Mom loved the hibiscus I planted in ceramic pots around the pool. Annuals with their shiny wax leaves flowered like crazy after a slow start. Explosions of crimson, sorry, explosions of crimson, they bloomed their guts out day after day. When the flowers finished, they rolled themselves into fists like fat cigars dropped to the deck. She watered daily, twice most days, shoving the hose through the chain links, limping and cursing, slamming water into the soil with such force the black dirt dove over the sides, fearing for its life and swam away on the sidewalk. How she loved those blooms, how she hated their need. Crimson. We had uh, a swimming pool and we had rose bushes around the pool that mom took care of. They, they were her obsession. So this is a poem from that perspective, Crimson. She calls me Rose and I am better than a daughter. I bloom three times a summer because she prunes me back to the fifth leaf. I reward her adoration with thorns so brutal they send her racing down the road to Mercy Emergency Room. She pulls out pictures of me at bridge when others coo over their kids. I'm six feet tall, a queen's robe around the shoulders of the pool fence, my, my petals velveting the water, clogging the filter, causing dad to sneeze, his eyes to weep. I am her pride and joy, her crimson glory. Once I pushed her too far, infected her hand good. She showered me with poison that like a child out of spite, I survived. Okay, this is a poem that I worked on for 12 and a half years. I was young at the time. I'm faster these days. And that doesn't mean that I literally spent every day working on this poem. It meant that it was not finished until it was finished. And I had to keep going back to it, so it's called Augusta. 
Your kingdom waning, I brushed your downy hair like a lady in waiting. I don't remember your voice or if we spoke at all when I rummaged through your drawers past the strands of emeralds and pearls. The brushes and hand mirrors, how royal they were, oval figurines captured forever in motion, as if your youth were entrapped in those brushes, as if I could know your youth by brushing your hair as you sat on your rocking chair throne. Your room was a castle and I traced backwards to find you. You were dead before I knew, learned of your flight from Austria after your husband deserted to drink, read that your bright son died after graduation at 13, heard that your daughter perished in the great flu epidemic. Your three surviving daughters bartered over who should devote a self to you in your oldness until your regime crumbled and you were imprisoned, a monarch in exile, in a hospital cell, awaiting judgment with other inmates, overgrown children in a permanent nursery, some tending dolls, replaying motherhood. You were my first lady, faded queen. I was the handmaiden for you my grandmother's mother. You, once so magnificent, stripped of command, crowned, chaperoned by nurses, remembering nothing. And still you sat, strapped in a rocking chair, quietly waiting for death to untie you. I inherited your room, the gaping bed swallowed me, the throne of a rocking chair where I strained to fit and expected your return. The rocker sprayed another color sits in my sister's room with clothes heaped on it. I visit you bound forever into the ground with vines. I brush away dead leaves like hair, wondering how that scrawny, naked arm of an apple tree attends you since my empty hand no longer can. Thank you, thank you. The reason I read that is because my mother also had dementia. <clears throat> and she, with dementia, you lose track of time so that everything in your life is happening in right now. So my mother would always say this, talk to me about childhood stuff, memories. And she would always say, remember, remember? So she had no idea that she was older than me, you know, which, so this is called echo. I know I repeat myself. I've always been this way. I repeat myself an echo, but I've always been this way. I used to have a perfect memory. I was known for it. Now, not so much. Everywhere I go, they ask me to sing. My voice is still pretty good for an old lady. When can I see you? I used to have a perfect memory. I was known for it. Now I can't remember anything. I sang in all those languages. Remember Italian, French? Everywhere I go, they ask me to sing. At the grocery store, the doctor's office. People call me on the phone just to sing to them. Have I told you that? When can I see you? Remember when I sang at the White House for two presidents? I can't remember whom. I was itty bitty, remember? I sang in all those languages, German, Spanish. When can I see you? My voice is still pretty good for an old lady. All those languages I sang in, Italian, German. Remember, I was known for it. I've always been this way. When can I see you? Now everywhere I go, they ask me to sing. I was known for it, my perfect memory, my perfect pitch. I know I repeat myself. You can just tell me to shut up. I used to have a perfect memory. All those languages, Spanish, Italian. My voice is still good for an old lady. When can I see you? My voice is still good for an old lady. Have I told you that? I know I repeat myself. You can just tell me to shut up. I love that poem. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. You know, that poem, is about a very uncomfortable subject, having a loved one uh, lose their sense of reality like that. But you do it so beautifully. Well, thank you. That is how I process stuff, is through writing poetry. 
Um, okay. Hold on, I gotta, I gotta change this order a little bit. Okay, I have to tell you a little, a little story about my mother. Um, <clears throat> my, my mother and father were going to an Orthodox temple. I don't know why. I just know that they went together and they walked in the door holding hands and someone came up to them and said they would have to separate men on one side, women on the other. And my mother's response was, Jesus Christ. So <laughs> that's mom. So I wrote this poem, which is the first one in my second book, The Little Mrs. Mrs. Adam. I regret nothing. The garden beautiful, but the sameness day after day. I needed no coercion. Tim Shell, the choice, my idea to eat the apple, to open the universe in my head. Look at a heart monitor, a flat line, bad news. I prefer wavy. Then, was this the genesis of fairness? The serpent slithers on his stomach, man toils in the field. Picture this. I hold a Cheerio in my right hand, well, thumb and forefinger, while in my left, actually tucked somewhat awkwardly under my arm is a watermelon. I'm supposed to pass this fruit through that hole for taking a bite from an apple. Jesus Christ, you call that justice? <laughs> okay, and I'm just to, uh, wait one second. How am I doing on time? More, more, more. Good. Okay. I'll, I'll do a couple light things. Just, uh. Oh, really? For, <laughs> for, for all for our fun? sakes. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, one of the first mothers before my grandmother or great grandmother or own mother was, of course, Mrs. Noah from the Ark. And, uh, she was the mother of them all in that sense. And so, uh, this is Mrs. Noah. 327. This particular poem is a sestina, which is a long, complicated form that I love to play with. Mrs. Noah, 327. With no preparation, no college course under my belt, survival was foreign to me. All I know the day to day, spray the rag, wipe the dust, vacuum, wear the costume of housewife, mother of three rowdy, untrained hooligans, trying to knit our family into a whole unit connected. I could tell the whole story now, how easy 30 years pass like water coursing down a steep hill. Now is it too late to retrain myself? Too late not by age, rather the circumstances before me now? I'm not sure where to begin. Be careful for what you pray for. My rebirth starts here with ducks, osprey, hawks, weasels, gazelles, griffin, Harpies, the whole world of beasts that burrow, fly, wear wild costumes of color, fabric, smooth and coarse. I can never return to my life before. I give myself over to the rain. I'd always let my husband hold the reins, trusting him to steer us safe from the prey of need, worry, despair. We were two, then four, now five, and with my son's wives, eight, a whole lot of grown people. There's tension, of course. Some days those humans touch my last nerve, wear me out as if I hadn't enough on my mind. Where do they disappear when I need them? I crane my head around corners and over shoulders. What's my recourse? Go it alone, as always, and continue to pray for strength. There's been a hole in myself for a long time. Not sure what for. I lost myself in routine. Before I knew it, found my spirit wearing out. I was fragmented, not whole. Now I swear Noah's power reign is ended once and for all. I pray no more wasted discourse. I move forward in the rain. I swear I'm new baptized, sprayed by holy water from this rough course. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, okay.
I'll save one more light one for later if we need our spirits lifted again. This is another, um, another Sestina called Lady Dainty. And it was the name of a beauty shop that my mother went to when I was a child and she dragged me along. And, you know, I think you've spent enough time with me now to know that I am neither of those two words. So this took me a long time to get this poem out, Lady Dainty. It pressed on me, time running out, time for one last chance, one more conversation with my mother. And of course I felt it most in my gut flaring up again since last Tuesday. And I feel like a kid again, that kid who failed, who never became Lady Dainty. Read my cracked lips, I couldn't do it. Not read, of course. I read to spend my time in a happier place where I was a pleasant child, one who turned out right and pleased mother. Weekends were hardest, I was such a tomboy, but by Tuesday I was calmer, pulled into the crowd, Invisible gut cramping and screaming unseen. Shut up, gut, I say with Librax and Paragoric. I read to escape, go deep underground, past Tuesday, holding my breath till the return of summertime when the living was never easy. I tagged after mother to Lady Dainty to get her hair done. A child, I ran errands, bought Cokes from Ellen Lee, a child in waiting. I was skinny drank soda which rotted my tender gut. All I wanted to do was please my mother, but I was not that kid. I continued to read, looking for myself in pages in a book. Time is not enough to heal the thousand Tuesdays. I climbed trees knowing I was no Sunday or Monday, maybe Tuesday, but more likely Thursday, red and green fairy child. It took years for that to sink in. So much time and all the Fridays and Saturdays straight to my gut, the place where I'm holding it in, so I read. How do I build the person house with no foundation for mother? How do I learn to be my own mother, every day fine, no slump or slouch on Tuesday, no statistic, no statistic that ends up in a book I read? Behind my eyes, I will always be a child, but I need to learn to mother my gut and be fine fall, winter, spring, or summertime. Chiseled in time, the mother-child enigma haunts me most on Tuesdays, here in my gut. Read me right, please, next time. Thank you, and if I have time, I'll do just two more. Is that, is that right, Aaron? Sounds mm -hmm. good. <clears throat> Wallflower. Roses on the wallflower, on the wallpaper bloom all year long, and in the mirror they shine crimson and green, the rug green like grass. Rainbows flicker from the chandelier, the doors open to the living room, mom's trinkets on the table, on the buffet, all the horses' heads on the magazine rack, the chairs, the standing lamp. Now it's dark at six. I am not a fan of the fall, even more so the winter. I've thrown mom's knitted afghan on the bed. It's very warm. She used to cast me on to knit my blocks. Now she can't see. How she loved her roses around the pool. Pr pruned them till her fingers bled. The roses on my wall have no thorns. They bloom all night long. Uh, and I think Oh, I have a couple. I have a couple choices here. Is what I'm telling you. Um, I'm not sure I can get through two of them. Uh, mm -mm -mm -mm. I'll try it. You Walk around it. heaven all day. You can do it. You can do it, Jake. Okay. You can do Thanks, it. Thanks, Mayor. Walk around heaven all night. This is a terzarima. Rhyme and repetition. It should have come as no surprise, you going all lunar on me, welcomed with open arms by the black skies, shining down monthly for all eternity, or so I hope that the light won't give out, especially since you've gone all lunar on me. 
Regarding your place in the galaxies, I have no doubt. You are at home moving among the stars, and I'm hoping the light won't give out. Tonight, you illuminate the dark. Sea fans blow in waves while you control lot tides. You are at home steering by the stars. Will I someday be a star at your side, watching as you orchestrate the galaxies, and from that vantage point joy derive? You left here filled with earthbound maladies. I watch you now as you orchestrate galaxies. It should have come as no surprise. You welcomed with open arms by the black, black skies. Thank you all so much. So let's bring it. I'm gonna start with a poem and then I'm gonna talk. I was just breathing in, out, thinking of walking, lift, sink, staring at springtime, pink, green, smelling the world. <sighs> there are some problems, pain, fear. My lungs are swollen, smoke, dust. I can't let go of, want more the deepest desires of soul. What were you thinking late night? Unloading your burden, I shrink. Under the toxins you blame. My freedom for all of your claws, no more will I reach for ribs, ears. My heart has spoken, I'm done. You buried the wonder instead of the seed, so I will eat summer alone. And I wanted to start with that because, Aaron, do you remember that poem? I took a, I took a class with Aaron at the library um, and I was told to write a sonnet. Um, and so when I was asked back tonight to think about poetry and resilience, um, I, I don't think just of what a poem looks like on the page, but the, cauldrons of transformation that are made possible when we gather together to bring forth our most articulate and vulnerable selves. And so, um, you know, like when, when someone talks about church, they're not talking just about the scripture or the Torah, they're talking about the, the way that the person smells sitting next to them. They talk about the way their body feelings. And so when I think about poetry and resilience, I think, for me, what has been most precious is about creating spaces where we can examine so much about our lives. And so um, as I move through poems and, and talking, uh, I had to come back to that piece, A, because Aaron called me up or you know, hollered af at me after a while, um, and B, because I've realized it's, it is a piece that uh, is a prayer and an incantation of my own body. And it's sort of like a self-soothing, like if, if I had a poem that was equal to sucking my thumb, that would be it. Um, so thank you for, for providing me a, some, a thumb sucker. Um, so today, February 17th, two things are happening. I mean, many things are happening. Uh, first, it's Rocco's birthday. Um, and because my old computer crashed and I didn't realize I hadn't transferred many of my files, I, I, I'm convinced that the Genius Bar at the Mac store will be genius. And I have a very limited, actually, things that I could find on the web, most of which are pu published by Mother Magazine. So most of it are about the, the score, the spawns running through the other room. Um, we'll get to that. But that narrowed my choice. Um, so that's one thing that, that I feel is kind of serendipitous today is the eight years ago what my, my psychic and body went through. And also we are smack, da smack dab in the middle of Black History Month. And when I was talking to Aaron about um, this event and who's on the panel, one of the things that he said was like, well, you know, I called these a couple other poets and, and they were like, Aaron, it's February, I'm busy. Like, what, you know, what's going on? What do you think? Yeah, call me in March. Um, so it's a it's a panel full of of white women or people who are Jewish and white and and myself. Um, and I think it offers rise to the occasion to at once celebrate Black history and also critique it, like celebration of the fact that people are saying, okay, we need some time to really examine um, the voices that we have actively silenced for so long and critique it 
because people should have a livable wage all year long and we should be valuing these voices year long. And I, the phrase, um, you know, making hay while the sunshine came to my mind and I thought about all the people uh, who do not deserve to have to make hay while the sun shines. Um, I think we, you know, we, we have to think of the, the labors of reparation that are still owed. Um, so thinking about how do I, as a person who walks with white privilege in spaces with, with other people who are walking with white privilege, like what do, what do I do, what can I do in honor of the celebration of Black History Month? Because anti-racist work needs to be done all the time, um, especially when there are no people of color to do it for you, right? So like, how do you do it? Um, how, how do you do what you need to do? Uh, and I, to walk through this world, to develop the emotional stamina and spiritual fortitude to accept other people's narratives and make space when it's not about you. And when it is about you, it might be asking you to inspect yourselves in ways that you don't want to be inspected. So I think um, most of my poems that I'll read tonight are much more, um, idiosyncratic and personal um, than some of my older work. I, I am a spoken word poet in that I love to be where the word is spoken. Um, and I am not in as many public spaces as I used to be when I am doing poetry. However, I am blessed to have a job as a lecturer and a, and a teacher um, where I get to use a lot of narrative voice to address lots of, of concerns of the public mind, like things that fit into beginning, middle and end into narratives. And so in some ways doing that work as an orator um, with students and with future doctors, um, in some ways has liberated my poetry to become even, even more concerned with an, inter an interior landscape um, to explore these kinds of things. So I'm going to go into some poems, I think, and then I'll stop a little bit after one of them. I don't mind being interrupted. I don't mind. Yeah. She's used to reading in those bars and bookstores where the crowd's like, say the poem. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And now people call me professor. It's really weird. I'm like, no, I'm the stop it. I mean, not that like that's all nice and stuff, but I, I don't think let's just say um, I didn't invite my students. Yeah. OK, so this is starting off um, in honor of Rocco. Which, you know, maybe he'll hear this, maybe he won't. He will remember none of this. I call him Fatso, little Rocco no neck in my sweetest tones, like I am shaving head to toe the new pledge who passed out at my frat party and filling his mouth with whipped cream. I wipe under his balls, pick his nose, pass him off to some nice stranger so I can eat my dinner with both hands. I put my boob in his mouth. I sing baby beluga again and again in funny accents while bouncing. You swim so wild and you swim so free. Perhaps he will develop an unflappable aversion to whale watching. Um, a lot of the work that I used to do was I, for a while I, I ran um, erotic poetry workshops with survivors of sexual assault. And that was definitely part of what I wrote about for a long time. Um, so uh, knowing that and knowing like, wow, what, what happens to a pregnant body that becomes very public um, and doesn't necessarily have control over itself. So um, this is about that in some ways. Opening. When my midwife tries to get a second finger inside my cervix to stimulate the baby's coming, it feels like I am being raped. There is nothing I can do about that fact. She can pull open my labial lips, knock the baby's head around my pelvic bowl. I can consent to those pains. Necessary, I can suppose. But somewhere between the vaginal canal and the inside of my bones, a new law emerges where my body is not my own. 
a slimy furred fanged beast with tits and wings in all the wrong places will gnaw your fucking head off. Don't ask me to be reasonable. Don't ask me to endure that which will not save my life, our life. A death of something will occur. Expend. Motherhood shows up like liquid God in the veins. You see it. The faint reflection shimmering on the surface we call glow. Go deep. It is nothing short of the power of being the creator. And you taste it, and then it drains out, one birthday at a time. Your little creatures mess up your hair, smash your car, watch your mouth. Nah, instead they'll razor up your womb from the inside with tongues only they know how, because they've been there, are of that meat. You have to kick them out again and again. Selfish parasites of chaos, eating abandoned for lunch. You see that too, the faint reflection draining on the surface. Go deeper, a shimmer of shipwreck, a carcass, skin slowly sinking into grooves of skeletal bones. Hormones deplete. What new drug will suck life into these hollow veins and eye sockets now? And then I had another kid, Ruby Booby. She leans into my breast like a teenage boy kissing with too much tongue, mouth open and sloppy wide, moving her lips side to side with her whole neck. I feel like the most luscious pillow, wet and fathomless with promise of eternal rest. This is called rebirth. There's no porn about hemorrhoids. I checked. There is scat galore, golden showers, amputee stump fucking, rape a rampant, race on display like exotic love slave flower vixen. But the little to large bumpy nodules hang below the radar of both subversion and, sub and scripted. Worse than worshipped, what worse than whipped, they are ignored. We all just want them to go away, quietly, but they linger, like children, like fatigue. How am I supposed to get my mojo back? Surgery? Really? After all that avoidance of needles and knives, no amnio, no pitocin, this will be my intervention downfall? To connect me to old school lava junkie vaginal me, I'm gonna shove this birthing badge of honor right back up my ass. Will I silence the vengeful song of the jealous smaller canal with the less glorious, less glamorous expulsions and, and a little placenta print jealousy? No little asshole, I'll rub you with homeopathic oils overpriced from France. I'll attempt to exercise and release, undo a lifetime of caffeine and clenching. I've always excelled at the eccentric worship of wounds. Um, fuck her. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I gotta take the sweater off. Don't worry, we got the First Amendment going on and the kids are in bed. You can say whatever you want. It's a small apartment. Fuck her, he wrote in his notebook. My mommy is a bitch. Then he stole my favorite word, meniscus, when asked for his own. Ooh, that's a good one, the teacher crooned. He's winning hearts with my charm while breaking mine at home. Am I winning or losing this battle? I can't quit. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit and then read two more poems because that's really all I got. But uh, I just wanted to go back to that poem about 
the cervix and the experience of the midwife um, and how when I was talking about before about like how does you know how does poetry create resilience in me how does poetry co create resilience in a relationship how does poetry um, feed a space for transformation that we so desperately need, you know, for, for so many reasons. Um, and, and specifically in the context of, of Black History Month and as a white person. Um, I think that it leaves, it, the, the practice of poetry for me um, leaves space for the yes and and in a very specific kind of way. Um, so that like it's built into the language of simile and metaphor as well um but that you can say something is like something so so for me in that moment of being able to say um and i actually shared it with my midwife and the, the other woman afterwards to be able to say this is what it felt like for me um it felt like rape i know you were saving my life i know that you were in my home and literally in my territory you know if it was a doctor it, it could have been a different conversation that ended up in cesarean section or 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 any kind of th anything else but for me in that moment being able to honor all of the horror and terror and wounds and defensiveness um in a space that's like helping me kind of map the internal um is what I need to do in order to to become in conversation with somebody else who can God, Natalie Diaz talks about it really well. Like it's this sort of radical thing where like you create a world inside of yourself so that somebody else can live there. Um, and the more you are like who you are, the more authentic the exchange is between poet and listener or between two people who are who are talking. Um, and I felt that um, I actually I went on a little bit of a, a research gig and I looked up um, Ina Mae Gaskin and she, she has the, the the sphincter laws and basically that you know has to do with with poetry um, or has to do with with uh, giving birth and she's a she's a midwife who's done a lot of writing about things and as I was reading about her sphincter law I was like that's not even a metaphor that's just like actually because the body and the brain aren't separate right like we are we think with our body and and it's all very connected in very many ways. And so reading about the ways that she said, I actually brought it up. There's, there's just a couple things that she, like the sphincters open best in conditions of privacy and intimacy. Sphincters open best without time limits. Sphincters are not under the voluntary control of their owner. They do not obey orders such as push or poop. Uh, they do respond well to, to praise. Um, the opening of sphincters can be facilitated by laughter. Um, when a person's sphincter is in the process of opening, it may suddenly close if that person becomes frightened, embarrassed, upset, self-conscious, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I was just, the reason I thought thinking about it that way is we, we use sort of in, in poetry, um, language so much of the time, like we, we map interior landscapes, right? Like we use this language as if, so we could turn a geography into, um, into meaning and, I think for me, um, there is a place inside of ourselves that, that is ruled, like most of our internal world that we literally cannot see, but is always hyper present, is ruled by these valves that only open and close under the right conditions. Um, and then, then we can all run fluidly. So, I don't know if that really came together. I had this great conversation with Aaron two weeks ago. I took all these great notes. And then, like I said, today I've been eating unicorn poop. But hopefully in there somewhere, there's a little bit of, of sense making about um, why I think that this is a, a practice of it, like simultaneously um, going there. And that's what, that's what it does for me. Um, OK, two more little poems. I love the feeling of a frog in my hand, a thumb-sized frog. I love the way I feel with a thumb-sized frog in my hand. Moist, slick, thump, 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 thumping. Watch how gentle I am with my captive. See how cooing my stroking touch. Regard my brave, small, slick, wild, and vulnerable 
is always somewhere terrifying. Watch me not crush it. And this one's called Intimate Earth for Harmony. I make poems like potters make coffee cups, designed to hold the tea of your life in your hands and help radiate its warmth. The mark curve of my world's voice shapes yours, intimate, sturdy, reusable, and okay just up on yourself, waiting until it's useful. So thank you.